You want to know the scariest thing in the world for a therapist? I mean, there's probably several scary things. A, a bear could attack you or a client could attack you, a client bear, a bear. Who, anyway, you know, an active shooter. Let me tell you the scariest thing in the world. It's hopelessness. To work with a client who's lost hope is one of the most triggering, disorienting things in the world for a therapist. Welcome to the Leading Edge in Emotionally Focused Therapy with your hosts, Dr. James Hawkins and Dr. Ryan Reyna. EFT is a dynamic model that humbles even the most seasoned therapists. Together, we want to come alongside you as you continually push the leading edge of your understanding and application of this wonderful model developed by Dr. Sue Johnson. So I guess I should start off with vulnerability. I remember being a new eft -er and working with George and Ryan, and there would be some times, like, you know, if I showed a tape or I talked to them about a session, and it would just feel bad. It would just feel bad. The couples were just really struggling, really stuck, really entrenched in their protection. And uh, I wanted to always find something positive. I didn't want to leave. I didn't want to leave the session feeling nasty. I didn't want to... I didn't want them to feel, and I, I'm having a hard time almost saying the word even right now, Ryan. Mm. I didn't want them to feel hopeless. <laughs> and uh, George and Ryan kept pushing on me like, you got to embrace it. You got to go there with them. And they're right. 100%. I was in some ways, and this is me talking about me, I was in some ways in my effort to not want them to be in a dark place misattuning. Now, I wasn't going to, I almost treated it like I was going to create hopelessness in them. No, the fact was, is I needed to highlight what was already in some ways was happening in them, whether it's in thought or in experience. That's just one part I want to tell. And then I'm, I'm excited to talk about this because uh, I was in with George out in Vegas and we we're at a the, the lovely Southern Nevada EFT community. Shout out to Dr. Annabelle. Um, for Dr. Bell, the EFT uh, person, um, you know, for just really wanting to put this on. And one of the, the things that we talked about out there with a lot of seasoned EFTers was um, hopelessness, how to, how to work with hopelessness. And, and they did great jobs. Their hearts were, I mean, I love their heart. And the, the struggle was that they, they had was one that I saw in me. They wanted to find a way to hurry up and get their clients out of it, not actually work with the hopelessness. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Somewhat of, you know, what happens is you and as the therapist when you sense hopelessness in the room and can you work with hopelessness or is your kind of move like me? I just want to hurry up and get you out of it. You know, how do you like it when you lose James? Oh, I do not like to lose. You don't like to lose? No. How bad? Oh, man, I will either not play something I, I could lose at or I will like, what did they say in CrossFit? We say we die for points. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't know about that. Uh, yeah, I don't like to lose either. Uh, you know, it's in a, in a little more serious tone. It's one of the things I work on in, in, in my life is working on that, actually. Uh, life will be a lot better if you were okay to lose a little. Mm. Uh, be, being hyper competitive is a nice little prison we make for ourselves. Mm -hmm. especially as former athletes. I mean, other than like, you know, making you ha a little bit better at a skill, all that competitive fear of failure, it doesn't do great things for us. So that's what I would want to say first is the good reasons therapists have to not want to work with hopelessness because hopelessness actually says you lose, mm -hmm. therapist. You have now failed at your job, right? And that puts us, that puts us as therapists in a bind. Mm -hmm. And because we don't want to do that, I mean, we we wouldn't even be sitting in that room with those letters behind our our names if we just gave up real easy. That's right. So so in order to not lose, in order to not fail, in order to not fail our clients, it can really throw us out of attunement and actually leave clients in hopelessness. Mm. What do you hear there? And and maybe you wanted to say something about the self, the therapist. No, um, well, <laughs> a couple of things I'd like to say about the self, the therapist. You know, this matters to me so much. You know, I'll be working with Dr. Chad Imhoff here on the March the 3rd. We're going to have a self of the therapist training. But let me make sure I say this. This is not therapy for therapists. This is just really kind of finding these parts, these kind of things like right here, like what happens to my body when this comes alive. So. There's that part. You know, so when Ryan said that, you know, we don't want to leave, like let this kind of make us feel like we don't want to let that that message that can come up the way we make sense of it, that we're failing, 
actually, you know, kind of go against the very good intentions we have. You know, we don't want to leave them there. But then when that message comes up, we do leave them alone with it. And so you're right. I appreciate the good reasons. You know, like how many hours did you all go and study in grad school? How many hours of supervision? How many case consultations? You did not prepare to fail. <laughs> you never worked to prepare to fail. And that's not what we're saying here either. But we do have to, you know, listen to the, the podcast before this. But we do got to get into the fray. And if the fray is in hopelessness and where they just feel like their attempts at repair are not working, we've got to join them there. So get and make sure this, if you didn't listen to the episode before this one, make sure you listen. It'll help make some more sense of this. Yeah. And, uh, you know, hopelessness is both an emotion and a strategy, right? It's both. So it's, it's, there's a sensation of hopelessness and hopelessness is not, probably not a great emotion word, right? If someone said they're hopeless, that's one thing I'd want to do is explore what that's like for them. That's right. So again, we definitely don't want to leave it too early. We'll say that several times. But emotion is also a strategy. Hopelessness is actually quite adaptive. Mm -hmm. And it's also very functional. Mm -hmm. So if I can kill my hope, I can kill my hurt. Right? Now that's not really true. But it is adaptive in the moment. So if I really, really want to ask someone for a date and I'm in high school or something and I get the sense they're going to say no, I don't ask. And that's not crazy. Nope. That's, that's a form of hopelessness. Yep. If I cannot want that person, then they really can't hurt me. Mm -hmm. And that happens in high schools everywhere and it happens – with 70-year-old adults who are in negative cycles everywhere as well. In fact, we just finished a, uh, a conversation before a couple hours before we came in here about sexual cycles with our friend uh, Joy McGowan. And uh, we were just talking about how if a sexual pursuer, the person who, who wants to have more sexual contact, if the sexual pursuer gets rejected a whole lot, it oftentimes, over time, their sexual bids for connection become less and less vulnerable. Less and less of their heart comes forward. And that makes perfect sense. It's kind of a hopeless sex, if you will. So there's great cost for offering solutions when someone is hopeless. It's like singing a happy song when someone is sad. It's really misattuned. Um, if you, on a previous episode with us, I'm sorry, I don't know the number, uh, also on We Heart Therapy, Dr. Bell's um, podcast and, and channel, um, I did, we did some talks about repetitively reflecting the attachment dilemma. And that's a form of reflecting hopelessness. So to continue to point out that, that someone does not have a good move, you don't have a good move. In fact, here's the reasons that you're hopeless. Here's the good reasons that you're hopeless starts to change the channel just a little bit. And that's kind of what we want to talk about here in a few minutes after this uh, commercial. We just want to take a minute and thank you for being a part of the Leading Edge podcast. We are really inspired and grateful when we hear from you in trainings or through social media about how this content is truly helping you push the leading edge of your learning and being able to apply emotionally focused couples therapy with your clients and some of you also in your own personal lives. And so at this moment, we just wanna ask you to consider helping us out. Yeah, James, I appreciate you saying that. When we first started this, uh, we had no idea it would take off like it has. We get contacts from all over the world. So it's really cool to think that we're coming through your speakers and in your devices or however you listen to us. Uh, we appreciate that. It's really an honor. And like James is saying, we want to ask you to consider helping us make this sustainable. We've gone back and forth on how we want to handle money or, or if we want to involve that. But the reality is to make this sustainable, uh, we do need to do some things and make some investments. So we have a Venmo account. We would love to ask you to consider partnering with us and joining us to, to make this sustainable, to take this to other people who are trying to help others around the world and even the next generation of therapists. So you want to talk about how they can do that? Yeah, if you want to be a part and you can, to support us, you can go to on Venmo at .cocklpc 
or on Cash App dot cock lpc with a dollar sign in the front and in the subject line just to help us know that you're a leading edge listener and you want to support us please put leading edge or here's a fun one we're doing we're playing with ryan put left in the comment line because you are part of the leading edge and emotionally focused therapy there you go so at doc hawk lpc yes correct okay all right and i want to say one thing really really quickly I know I interrupted that commercial in a strange spot, but it was just getting long. I wasn't saying it quickly enough. Uh, Yeah, right. But no, for real, we thank you all for your support and everything you've done. But if you haven't been able to get, that's fine too. We just love doing what we do, but it is appreciative and it does help. We keep getting, Ryan was like, you keep improving things. Like, yeah, I take, I take, I take this pretty seriously and I really enjoy it. So yeah. So wait, is it, you want me to go to the, some of the practical elements of it now? That'd be great. Yeah. All right. So, you know, so even when we're out in Vegas, I just want to kind of jump in there. Like, you know, so really it was how do we help work with hopelessness, whether they've said it, you know, we're not calling it even just an emotion, but the experience where things really maybe seem hopeless for the couple or give me a description of like this place. So one part I want to start with, though, is explore one ground yourself. Let's not remove our humanity from the therapeutic process, please, therapist. Right. Like. So when we sense it, just kind of for me, you know, at least I know, it's like kind of check it. Like, is this hopelessness, your frustration with somebody's protective strategy? And like you're just kind of maybe it's your eighth client of the day or fifth client of the day and just cycles have been whipping your butt kind of thing. Check that part out. Um, And then just kind of like as you sense it in your body, what is your body trying to go and do? And who is it in the service of and are you leaving anybody alone in a dark place, right? So just want to check that. Like if I'm going to move forward, am I trying to get them out of a place without without me appropriately showing them that I see it? Right? It's good that you want to rescue, but I need them to see that I see and I'm experiencing what's happening in the room. And can we name it too? Can we put a description to what's happening? Emotion with no description or a label is even more distressing than the emotion itself, right? And so that's to explore for so that's an explore for the self of the therapist piece. And then somewhat like Let's open it up and make sure that we can explore what's happening for the client. Like, even if they say, I just feel so hopeless, what does that mean? What does that mean for them? And really help get it clear. What's the meaning when you say that? Like, what, you know, what's going on? Like, what is it that makes you, what's the trigger for this? What kind of brings it up right now? What, is that, what does that mean? Um, and then uh, the, the, one of the go-to interventions, this is my favorite one, and I appreciate when Ryan kind of taught and shared this repetitively reflecting that attachment dilemma is so powerful. And let me say, it's not just though you do it one time, the way we typically teach it, right? You jump in if you want to say anything, but we usually reflect it three to five times and we switch our gear and tone as we do it. If the client, if the, if we're the client's tracking with us and the, you give us example, I, I was going to ask you the same thing. Yeah, there you go. You want me <laughs> okay. to do it? You got it. That's up to you. You choose. I'll, I'll try my, I'll try a shot at all right, it. All right. We call Ryan the big dilemma around here sometimes too. So <laughs> it, it feels funny doing the attachment dilemma in front of the big dilemma. Mm-hmm. Um, no, um, but with the with the with the attachment dilemma, it's showing them the moves that they have to try and make things right. So, I'm, so let me go ahead and get into that moment. So let me slow down and make sure I really really get this. I, I'm what I'm beginning to see is it seems like you have no good move here to repair the disconnect in this relationship or to find your way back to each other. So let me make sure I really get this. And I kind of I guess the pursuer is coming into my mind. There's a part of you that you know, like you try to speak up to point things out, to say, hey, something happened here, or I need you. And you're showing that not to like make your partner feel bad, but you're showing it to make sure that your relationship can be that you two are connected. Because if we don't address these problems, what happens to your relationship? You get more, you get further away, nothing changes. Man, that sucks. But then when you speak up and say something, what happens? People say you're mean, you're too much, you're cold, uh, you're just so negative. Ugh, and then that hurts. But then if you do, there's many times where you try not to say anything because you don't want to come across that way. You don't want to make people feel bad or uncomfortable, so you don't say anything. And then not saying anything, what happens? You know, you're trying once again hoping they'll see it, maybe hoping they'll notice it so you don't have to be the one to bring it up. But then when you say nothing, what is that like for you? Nothing happens. Nothing changes. And then you're just sitting with that pain alone. (sighs) Oh, my goodness. 
Let me really, really make sure I get this. Of course your body gets triggered here. Something big is happening. The two of you are disconnected. There's a threat here that's not being addressed. And so then you try to say something. Your body mounts up the energy to protect this thing, to make sure that everyone sees the threat so we can address it. But then when you do that, you get blamed. Man, wait, I'm really letting this hit me. Like you're trying to say something to make it good, but it goes the opposite way. And then you know that that's, you've learned you're so intelligent and you know that that, so you try to rein some of that in and not and like, or, or be a little bit quiet, say it a little bit softer or say nothing. But then that just leaves you with that feeling of being disconnected and the fear all alone in your body. You have no good way to deal with this fear at all. This is really, really sucking. And then on the third go around, I would drop it even slower. And I might say something like, my gosh, wait, hold on. My body's really catching this. How hopeless this could feel to not have any good move. That saying something makes it worse instead of making it better. And saying nothing, literally just having to watch our relationship just sink to the bottom of the ocean. And no one's in, in like, I'm the only one that's seeing it happen. <sighs> what is this like for you to not feel like you have any good move for this relationship? And so that's just one way, like just doing three repetitions there and letting the hopelessness come alive and how the, just how it is. Yeah. And, and your voice, your pacing is really important. You know, so that's my first note over here. Hopelessness is a form of grief and mourning. Uh, you know, not all grief and mourning is the, the death of someone. Sometimes grief and mourning is the death of a vision. Mm. This could have been good, but now I don't think it can be good anymore. Mm. And so that has to be matched with us working slower, our grief voice. Mm. And uh, so we really want to slow down. Um, I think it's really important what you said about explore. What, go, spend a, go spend more time than you think you should. Mm. Actually, let's go five times more than you think you should. <laughs> go explore the good reasons they have to be hopeless. That is, for many therapists, extremely difficult to do. Let's go look at, I mean, go be a lawyer for hopeless. Mm. Because if you can achieve that, what you've actually said is I'm with you. Right? So beware of the solution trap. It's so tempting to see someone hopeless and be like, well, if you'd be more vulnerable, right? Or if you'd show up more, or if you try the I statements, you know, or positive startup, and I'm not knocking Dr. Gottman's research there. Those are, those are descriptive findings about relationships. Those are not prescriptive doesn't work. It doesn't work backwards going into distress. So, so offering someone of a, a solution um, when they're hopeless uh, abandons them. It actually tells their neurology that they shouldn't feel what they feel, which actually makes them even more hopeless. Uh, don't forget to blame the cycle too, though. You can always blame that cycle. The cycle's a, a nice explanator for the hopelessness, right? So it's not just that you don't have a good move. It's also when the cycle takes over, there's not a good move. Mm -hmm. You say something, you, it's going to make everything worse, and you're even further apart than when you started. So you try to not be too much. You don't say something, nothing happens. The worst case scenario, right? So, so blaming that cycle lay, layered in throughout as you explore hopelessness is, is pretty key. Um, yeah, don't just don't leave it too early. I got two more notes. Don't leave it too early. And it doesn't really matter if you have it. What matters is do they see that you have it or do they see that you see the hopelessness and the good reasons they have? And if you just get in a hurry because you're nervous or whatever reason, you, you probably left part of them there. And the part of them that's left there is usually a very vulnerable part and therefore a really resourceful part. And then the transition. If I can stay with you in hopeless for, I don't know, 12 minutes, 14 minutes, 16 minutes, and you, know, you take that deep breath, which says, all right, I've now resonated with you. We're in a good window. 
I can just go, so what's it like to hear me say that? What's it like to describe that place for me? So reflecting over and hopelessness over and over and over is actually evoking. And if I can really, really resonate with your hopelessness, your body doesn't have a choice but to bring forth an emotion in that moment. And when I can capture the emotion that happens in that moment, now we're right back in the game. That can potentially be a mission that we go on. Is that making sense? 100%. So, y'all, thank you. I think the main heart for me like in wanting to do this podcast was, hey, these are hard moments where our clients need us. We don't want to let even our good attempts to be turned against us to make us kind of go away from the very thing that all of us have trained to do, which is to work with people in hard places at times and distress. And then how do we be able and how to go there? Because once again, we don't want to feel like, you know, we're pushing them closer to that edge and you don't have to, but we do need to know how to go towards that edge with them and help them kind of have a different experience. They're on the edge for many good reasons. And so that's what we're trying to kind of help you capture in this and like to help you have some moves. So that way your body's not caught off guard with, you know, one thing when client said, and um, that client, one <laughs> trainee said, Hey, it's hard to check. It's hard to track the map when you're driving in, in busy, chaotic traffic. So what we're trying to do is load you up here to kind of have a plan for when this moment, these moments come up, you'll be ready for it. Not just trying to kind of, uh oh, I better figure out something now with it running all live, which we have to do that sometimes, by the way. So, Brian, you were going to say something? Yeah, I just I want to make a distinction between the sensation and the function of yeah. hopelessness and suicidality. Obviously, we don't want to push people towards suicidality. <laughs> no. uh, I think most therapists panic a little too early. Um, a little bit of statements of, I'm not sure I want to live anymore. They're more often expressions of pain than intent. Mm -hmm. But obviously, we're listening for that. Mm -hmm. And if it's really extreme hopelessness, we want to, you know, we want to sandbag the back of our sessions that there's enough safety. Yes, right. But we definitely don't want to leave the emotional channel too early. No. Like, so I've seen people like someone was just trying to express hopelessness and they, they go get a form out and do a suicidal assessment, you know, and it's like, ah. I appreciate the intent, but uh, we broke attunement a little too fast right there. So I just want to make that comment. But obviously, we have to have uh, we have to have safety before we can do any dynamic work. One hundred percent. And the big part is be willing just to stay there and help them talk to you about it. That is helping what like kind of make sure if we're talking about efit not leaving them alone with the hopelessness, or if we're talking about a couple and the hopelessness of the relationship, where the and as Ryan said, where the negative cycle. I think it's, that's where we need to blame. It's the negative cycle makes them feel so hopeless. Thank you all for listening. Thank you for listening. We hope this experience helps you push the leading edge in your work to help people connect with themselves and with each other. Please subscribe to our podcast and leave us a five-star review. You can contact us at push the leading edge at gmail.com and you can follow us on our facebook page at push the leading edge you can follow ryan on facebook at ryan Rayner professional training and on his website ryanrainertraining.com you can follow james on facebook and instagram at doc hawk lpc you can also check out his website doc hawk lpc.com Thank you.